What do you think of AI? Do you think it's going to take over and ruin the industry? What we do is so intricate and so feeling based. I don't think we're close to AI figuring out how to replace the mix and mastering engineer. Welcome, welcome to the Reverse Engineer Podcast with your host, co-owner of Mastering.com, and de facto Bob Ross of Music Education, Caleb Wilkes. Hey everyone, welcome in. Here today with the one and only Devon Terrell. How you doing, Devon? I'm doing pretty good. Um, super excited just to, you know, nerd out just about what, you know, what we love to do and stuff like that. And um, yeah, just having a good time, just working with you guys over the course of the last month. And um, yeah, just here to just chat and just talk audio. Yeah. I mean, you, you've had kind of a, a split career in a lot of ways. You've been an educator, but you've also been an artist. Your artist channel is uh, almost a million subscribers now, and you've had Billboard uh, topping songs, and you've done all this, but you also have a great uh, channel for education. Help Me Devon uh, is the name of that, and you've you've been an educator too, so it's it's been kind of interesting. You have this kind of d uh, dualistic career in a way. You're doing a lot of stuff. What is it you're working on You know, right now? Uh, so right now, um, obviously, I've literally just finished up a project, uh, you know, an album for my artist side. Um, and like you said, it's so weird because I do feel like I super do have like two sides of my life, like two completely stark, um, you know, different coins. And um, on my artist side, I just finished up an album, just finished up a project. So everything you could imagine under the sun as far as being an artist, getting that together, you know, rollouts and things of that nature. But then obviously I have the other side, which is the education side, engineering side. Um, and yeah, to, you know, have to mix and master. Um, and I just been really just engaged into my channel, just engaged to the, you know, fanship that we've created over there, just with our own podcast, for instance, with my audio nerds and just kind of entertaining that space. So, you know, I just been really just pushing forward, man, and just kind of just doing what feels good. Just release the plugin on that side of the Help Me Devon side. So that's also a fun new thing that we're kind of doing over there. Um, and that's it. I'm really just, go re honestly, man, I'm really just going my gut doing what feels good and just having fun, you know, and whatever's next and stuff like that. Are you the kind of person that needs a lot of different stuff going on to, to have fun? Uh, I'm kind of the same way. Is that, is that kind yeah. of the, the mental yeah. space for you? Yeah. Like I bet you for you, vacations are hard. Um, uh, you need to stay busy, you know, and, it's hard to sit down, man. You know, the only way I can sit down is if I'm mixing for hours, you know, that's the only way I can like really like just kind of lock it. I feel like I just need to keep my brain. My brain needs to, I just got to stay busy. Like that's just the way I'm, you know, set up and stuff like that. And I'm sure you're the same way, you know, in that regard. So. Yeah. I haven't seen my wife in months, you know, I've been down, <laughs> been down in the studio for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I should check in. She'll come probably. down. Yeah. She'll like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. Just don't, I'm, I'm working. Please give me three more hours. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's it's good. Yeah, yeah, vacations are hard. But yeah, I also have to be doing a lot of different things. I like to yeah. just keep my yeah. mind really engaged right. with a lot of and different going. stuff. Yeah, I understand that. You know, I always I like to go back with uh, people that I'm talking to. I think it's interesting always to find out what makes people tick, where it came from. So right. going back in time for you, where did all this passion for music start? Was right. it in the childhood? Right. Tell, tell right. us about where that where that came from. Um, so honestly, uh, it was a it was the most one of the most random things ever. Uh, I was literally in I never forget. I was in third grade and a lady had came to our classroom and she said, we're casting people for The Wizard of Oz. Um, anyone in here that I can sing for some reason at I think I was seven years old. I rose my hand. Don't know how I knew or was like, oh, yeah, I could sing. And I remember singing and everybody was like, holy crap. And after that, I remember my mom coming to the play after I got the part. And she was like, I didn't know you could sing. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it just became my identity. You know, it just became I was the kid that sang. So carry that forever. You know how that goes. It's that really pivotal moment in your life where you go like, oh, people say you're good at something. And it's just like that just became my life. So it kind of carried over uh, hand over fist with that. And in high school. You know, I was going to studios, I was recording with friends. And remember back in those days, it was tough to record. You know, equipment wasn't, you know, people with home studios were like gods, like in our community, like, yo, he has a studio, like it was a big deal. So I was recording with that person, but we weren't recording as much as I would like to. So that's what spawned me saying, yo, you know what, I'm gonna learn this myself. And then that part of my life, like started getting where I was like, you know, starting to get more into like actual learning 
audio engineering and stuff like that. And so the careers clashed, and then that's how this whole thing just kind of carried over hand over fist. And then that's when I went to Full Sail University to get a formal like education uh, when I first started, because there was no YouTube. You know, this didn't exist. You know, places like yours didn't exist. So that's what I had to do for mine. And that's kind of how my career kind of carried over. Does the music run in the family or where did it come from? Where, where did you no. get this voice? Yeah, no, that's the crazy thing. Like music doesn't run in my family. Everyone in my family is in the medical field. It's it's strange. Uh, I, it kind of this creative thing. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. It just just is in me and my family knows like I'm just the creative one, like the really, really creative one. Um, and the one that's musically inclined. My mom did a little singing back in the day as she would like to claim now that I'm her son. She's like, oh yeah, it's, <laughs> it runs. I'm like, no, it doesn't. No one sang, no one really did music, but yeah, I'm the only one in my family that really does like music, music um, for the most part, yeah. Do you have a first uh, memory of, of hearing a song growing up that changed mm -hmm. music for you or just dropped a bomb on your brain to, that just really inspired things? Yeah, it was, uh, oh, it's such an old song, and I'm sure no one knows what it's called. It was called called I'm Dreaming, and uh, it was by an artist. It's a, it's an old R&B song. It was like, don't wake me, I'm dreaming. It's an old song, but it had like that um, Teddy, uh, that Teddy Riley kind of swing to it, like that New Jack swing kind of vibe. Uh, it is old, and please let me get the artist. Uh don't wake me. It's old. Uh, it was by Christopher Williams. That's it. Christopher <laughs> Williams. I'm dreaming. Old where, song. Where, and that I literally, my mother would have to take the take the tape from me. You know what I mean? Because I would play it over and over and over again. That really changed everything for me. Where were you when you heard it? I, I was remember? at my. I never forget. Isn't that weird how yeah, music I has like remember. this? Yeah, you don't forget. I was so young but i was at my grandmother's house she had one of those heavy massive high like uh, stereo systems with like you know where you had the plug in <laughs> you had to kind of be an engineer back in the day for having audio systems um and it was this system and man i just knew how to play that tape like that's all i knew and i was at my grandmother's house and she had a little living room and i used to just play it and just dance in the living room all day like that song hit for me constantly love that yeah, yeah i still remember mine front porch of my house uh, -huh. uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't even a great system. Like what you're talking about. It was one of those right. handheld recorders for that had oh, a cassette wow. tape into it. So the playback feature on that was all I had with a, you know, I'm sure a speaker the size of a, a quarter on there, but, but I right. randomly plopped in a tape and the first song that came up was Bohemian Rhapsody and it didn't mm. matter. It didn't matter that, that it <laughs> didn't sound great. Right, my, my mind exploded for sure. Exactly, you like this is look at this. Like, what is this? You know, like yeah, it's defining. You know what I mean? Like when you hear something that's really pleasing, and you, I think the curiosity is what it strikes us. Where it's like how, like how you can't fathom how this got created. You know, and then when you learn more about the process, it becomes more intriguing and so on and so on. So I know what you mean. Like it's 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 incredible. You know, like that's why I love it so much. You've had a lot of success and you've, again, had uh, some billboard chopping tunes and albums that you've released. Yeah. But what's your favorite piece of music that you've ever made and what makes it really special to you? Um, Probably my favorite piece of music that I've made is it was this album that I put out called The Raw Sound Volume 1. Um, and the reason why I did it is because I feel like at the time no one was doing kind of what I was doing and the rollout for it was so fun and engaging that I really just think it um it was probably the most fun I was having just with music. I was literally releasing one song every single week. Um and you know, I released it every single week. Music videos came out with with some of the songs and stuff like that. And on the 18th week, which which was the last song, I said you just heard an album and I want you all to guess the order of the story of what I just gave it to you. And it was it was just so fun and engaging and just to watch people go back, you know, all the way back to the winter time, now that we're in like fall, and say, okay, well, this song has to be beginning. And this, it was, what made it so fun was the fact that it was so engaging. You know, it wasn't just music, but more or less, it was more of a story and it was something that people really connected to. So that was probably the most fun I probably had um, 
you know, when it came to a project or just creating something in that regard. And I was playing around with the animations, like 3D animations and stuff like that. So it was it was really cool. I had a video game attached. It was it was it was a lot. <laughs> wow, that's a yeah. bit that's pretty ambitious. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a lot. So did they get it right? <laughs> did anyone kind of uh, nail it? Someone did, and I, I, they won like 500 bucks. They won like a phone call from me and like a, a, a shout out on the album. Like it was like, I, you know what I mean? I really made sure that whoever did it right, you know, really got their just dues and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, somebody did actually get it, which I, I feel like they, I don't know. I was like, did you hack my phone? Like how the heck did you get 18 <laughs> songs perfectly in order? No way. So they got all 18 perfectly. All, all 18 perfectly, which was insane. Yeah, yeah. They had chats. They were kind of like, you know, conspiring with each other like no it has to be this this it was so fun to see it was dope to see like it was dope and this was before discords this was like in a um they were doing it in facebook group chats back in the day yeah wild insane so you have a knack for this uh kind of uh content creator position because that's a that's like very very smart i think anyone thanks, listening thanks. who is trying to create content like you just have to make stuff that's really engaging right yeah uh, yeah what 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 is your thought process when it comes? It, it seems like um, something's coming very naturally to you. Do you have a, a system for that, or what is it that has helped you be successful there? Um, you know, when it comes to content creation, um, I think what it is is I think my age does come into play because I come from the school of before the internet, like you know, like probably like you and I. Um, and we know what it was like back in the day where it was like. You had to physically be there in person. I was giving out my CDs. You know, I was always a part of that community. So when I first seen the internet, I gave, I went all in. And a lot of my friends were like, yo, you gotta be outside and you gotta meet. I'm like, I'm telling you, I can reach way more people than you in a day on the internet than I can in person with anyone. And you know, they didn't, they weren't, a lot of people weren't supporting me in that regard. I'm talking about, this is before Instagram. Like this is how early I was on the internet as far as saying, dog, I'm telling you, YouTube and Facebook, I'm sticking to it. And um, I kept punching at it, kept punching at it. And eventually something went viral and then it was over. And then my whole life changed. So it was just kind of seeing the trajectory of like, the internet, man, you know, and I think a lot of musicians were straying away from it. Like they, they didn't think it was like a purist, you know, it was like, ah, I'm, I'll, I need to be with the people and stuff like that physically in, uh, in person. And I was like, I can really reach a lot of people and I'm, and you can touch them, you know, from their computer screen. So I think it was just, just being ahead of that curve as far as knowing and seeing the future, like, oh, the internet is where it's at. And I know that sounds crazy to someone maybe born in the two thousands, right? Like, like it's always been here. It's really it hasn't, you know. No, it I started. remember. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Like that's what I'm saying. So I'm, yeah, so it was just about being ahead and seeing. Okay, what's next? You know, where's everything headed next? Yeah, and that was it. What do you think? The, what do you think the next thing is? Man, um, it's tough because, and this is a great. This is such a great conversation. So, independence, right? Like an independent artist. I feel like that's the most important part of our, our industry because that's where the rawness gets created. And then I feel like you take that rawness and you polish it with a major or with, you know, with the with the bigger, you know, kind of uh, institutions. During like the 2000, I'd say 12 to like 2017, that was like the golden age of independent music. Like I can't tell you how many, I was listening to more indie music back then then I was listening to major artists. And the reason why is because us as indie artists, we were making a lot of money because it was just a free for all. Social media was getting us to cut out the middlemen of everything. We didn't need, we didn't need TV, like TV started to dwindle. We didn't need to be on all of those traditional platforms anymore. We could literally just reach our fans. Remember, there were chronological timelines. So I know if I have 20,000 followers throughout the day, I'm gonna hit more than half of those people probably, you know? So. I just think during that time, we were making plenty of money selling merch directly. Our music was 99 cents to buy a single. It was a beautiful, it was the most beautiful market. If I put out a song and I had 10,000 fans and 5,000 of them bought the single, I just made 5,000 bu bucks. You know, it was, it was so dope. Like you, I didn't need a huge fan base in order to survive, you know? So I, what happened was, you know, streaming came along. It diluted the streaming sales. Now I'm making point zero zero one three of a penny per person you know it just kind of diminished our sales and that's why i feel like the independent scene really not died off but it really took a big hit where it's like you know it's it's harder to invest 
or do really cool things as an indie artist. It's kind of like we falling back into the model of, okay, major label, give me some money so I can invest in, you know, doing ABC and stuff like that. So I think that's what's changed a lot. And I think what needs to happen is some type of value has to come back into that independent community. Like we have to figure out some way to monetize our independence again so that we can create freely as we want. Like, that's what I really think has to happen. Do I have the answer? Absolutely not. But um, I think that's where the problem lies as far as everything is concerned, as far as, you know, trying to step it up and change everything and innovate. Do you have any ideas of what could be a solution to that? I have a crazy idea. And, you know, I've gotten heat for this once or twice. Uh, And what I've said is, I said, hey... When it comes to Spotify and Apple Music and all of these streaming platforms, right? I said, I think that people paying $10 a month for the entire library of music is insane. I was like, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a, I don't think it's fair. Um, I think it's fair to the consumer, right? It's great for you, right? As a consumer, but I think to the artist, it really does a disservice. So what I said was, what if for $10 a month, you can have a host of 50 artists only that you can continuously swap in and out 50 artists and those 50 artists get the lion's share of your subscription payment and if next month you're like okay i'm done with that artist i want to bring in kendrick lamar's album now that that album could start to make heavier money um according to those people because if my fanship is listening to me then maybe let's give more money to that person that is keeping that person on the actual platform so my belief was 50 artists uh Here's the $10 a month. Maybe I get way more money than 0.0013 because I'm a part of the 50 artists of that person. And when my album comes out, I fall into more of people's 50 artists kind of playlist. So now my album, when it comes out, I'm incentivized to go, okay, I'm going to get a big surge of, you know, of just mo- money and monetizing them. So that has been my plan in my head. Do I think that's going to happen? No, because I think everyone would, would be mad. But that's that's where I've fallen into as far as it. We we have to put value back into the actual single or the the music itself. You know, like this this isn't sustainable for an independent artist. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, you have to get a lot of streams these days to 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 make much money with it, right? Tons. See, like this, if I get a million streams, that might be about four thousand dollars. What? Like, could you imagine? Like back in the day, dude. If let's say a million people are is fifty thousand people. Let's just say that's fifty thousand people. If I got 50,000 people to give me 10 bucks, that's half a million dollars. <laughs> so it's just like, it's just unfathomable. Like I look at my stats and I go, dude, I should be rich. You know, I should be ridiculously rich with seeing myself get, let's say just a million streams a, mo- a month. I, a million streams a month and I get maybe two grand. That's, come on, man. You know, like it's it's a tough time. Like it's a tough time for art, for musicians. And that's why I have like, multiple streams of income you know because i have to diversify or, or else you'll, you'll it's a sinking ship you know at yeah. this point i think a lot of us are doing that both you know just uh, diversifying yeah as artists yeah um, heck yeah we have to do you think there's an upside though to the access that streaming gave the independent artists at the same time yeah so i think that it gave discoverability like hands down like you know like i think it's so easy to get discovered um uh nowadays um which is powerful. Obviously, the trade-off is, you know, a million people can see you, but it's not going to pay your bills kind of thing. So in my head, I say to myself, okay, well, what's worth it? And in the back of my mind, I say, yeah, I think being able to reach a certain amount of people, let's say 20,000 people, and let that pay the bills, to me, something about that is just, I don't know, something about that feels better, you know, as opposed to saying, yo, man, I got 50 million views. And it's like, yeah, but you know, you can't, you still can't survive, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an, it's a conundrum. So yeah, it gives more discoverability, this, you know, discovery, but you know, what good is that discovery if you can't survive? You know what I mean? And I can't keep investing to make it better and better, you know? So there's a trade-off, you know, it, it, there's definitely a trade-off and there's definitely ways to monetize today. Of course, you know, shows and things of that nature, merch, but it would be nice to make some money off of the actual music. It would be really nice. <laughs> yeah, we teach a lot of diversification in our program uh, for the reasons that you're talking about. In terms of right. diversification, if if you know there are artists listening to this, right. what, what's a what are the first steps to diversify? What, what's the low hanging fruit when it comes to diversification to start getting a little bit more income? 
definitely merchandise for sure like that's like probably the low like when you say low hanging fruit like that's probably the easiest thing if you have a brand and you have music um and you got a single that's doing well sell merch or strictly off of that single you know people still love buying cds like that's really dope still it's not it's a nostalgic kind of you know, memorabilia too. yeah exactly vinyls are dope um i think i seen a stat that said vinyls outsold cds for the first time in years it was like weird stuff like like so there's certain trends as far as merchandise um that's really powerful that can really make you some extra some extra coin um it's a little tougher to sell that stuff but people will buy it if they're really fans so definitely merchandise is like top top low hanging fruit it's right there give it a shot like definitely that what about leveraging social media can that can that lead to anything that's considered low hanging fruit tiktok everything else like that or what do you think oh, of yeah. that whole route so i think I think brand, brand partnerships and sponsors are low hanging fruit again. You know, if you build up enough, like we were saying before, as far as saying, okay, yeah, you got, you know, you got a million people that listen to you, but it's hard to get, you know, money from it. Well, what you could do is you can, like you said, leverage your social media as far as your followers and your stuff like that and say, hey, I got a sponsor from some drink, um, you know, some sports drink or something like that. They pay you $5,000 for a post or they pay you a certain amount of money for a post. That's great, you know what I mean? Like that's a that's another way to kind of monetize um, your audience, you know, and that's a big thing, like that's huge. And that's kind of where we fell with independent artists where it's like, we don't really make money off the music, but we make money off of our popularity and kind of converting that audience to just ads. Like we become billboards, like, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's really what we become is just walking billboards, you know? Um, so yeah, I think, that's kind of low hanging fruit is the merchandising um, and the brand partnerships and sponsorships and stuff like that, sponsored posts and stuff like that. That's interesting because what I, I think one of the things that means for people is that all these artists are going to have to start thinking like business people. Yes. Oh, how and does, that's the thing. And how does that change when you have have to have more of a business mindset when it can't just be about music? Does that change right. the artist? That Does that change the music? Is there a downfall oh, yeah. to that? What do you think? Yeah, I think it definitely hurt. It, I don't want to say hurts the music, but it definitely adds a contingency to the music, right? Because you could say to yourself when you're making a song, and what sucks and what I try to stop myself from doing is I'm making a song and I say, oh, this would be great for TikTok. It's like, no, don't do that, you know? But it's it's an unfortunate, yeah, we do think like that sometimes. You know what I mean? When I hear certain songs, I'm like, yo, I think this will work really well for TikTok. It, it's changed my perception of picking the single, you know? I don't say, oh, this is going to emotionally tie them. No, I try to think about, oh, they're going to do a challenge to this or, oh, wow, they're going to like something, you know, something can go viral from this. I think it's changed a lot of people's mindset with the music. And it's tough not to. I think I'd be a liar if I sat here and said, you know, I'm not, I haven't said that to myself making a song like, oh, wow, I think that's going to work for TikTok or something like that. It's definitely changed how we kind of, make music some people uh lesser than not which of course i respect that totally but i think for the for the most part with musicians i think it is something we think about as far as i think this will work on social media i don't know if this will and that's it but i tell you now it's always what we don't expect to work i tell you i will tell you from experience the things i don't expect to work i'm like what like why did that work so you never know but yeah that's in the back of my mind all the time yeah, that's that's really, really interesting. So maybe the mindset shift for a lot of artists, maybe artists that are listening to this right now is like the the music's very important still. It still needs to resonate with people. It still needs to be great. And in a lot of ways, like it's indie music still being listened to. I don't know what this yeah. is. I heard a statistic. I can't remember what it is off the top of uh, my head, but it's like something like 70 percent of all music being listened to is like independent music. Like That's awesome. You know, it's, that's it's, it's, awesome. it's a lot. Right. Um, right. But I think the mindset shift is then um, it's not the music that is the business. It's the self. It's the person. It's the artist that's the business. Right. Right. I'm the IP. Right. I'm the intellectual property, you know. And obviously, if I go to a label, a label will pay to own me to sell themselves. Like, it, it's interesting, right? Like, every artist is a business. And all of your songs are assets or intellectual property. So it's like under my business of Devon Terrell, I own this album, this song, this album, this song. These, This is the business of me. So if a label comes in, they say, okay, we're going to own your business and your intellectual property, which are your songs. Those are your assets. And so they try to exploit 
you know, those songs to kind of get back that money that they just paid for the asset. So it's, it's so weird. Like we're like, we are literally just businesses. Like every artist is just a business. And it's like that business is doing well. This one has one asset that's like, you know, makes a lot of money. Like we want to jump on this to see if we can kind of expand that business. So I keep that in mind too, as far as how a label thinks. And they see each one of us as a business, like that business, like the, you know, has assets. It's the songs. How much, how, how many intellectual property pieces does this business have? You know, I have a huge catalog. So that looks attractive to a business. So yeah, we become businesses straight up. And you're following. That too. Right. right. The business already has, you know, a, a, a loyalty, like a customer base. Like I'm trying to change the words, right? Like kind of shifting it that way. Like, okay, here's my customer base, you know, that are loyal customers. Yeah, exactly. So that's the mindset shift, I think. People need to yeah. start utilizing, owning that intellectual property, creating great stuff, right. but also having a following, keeping track of a following, engaging right. a following. And then right. that's your value, right? As you yeah. approach... Uh, businesses and brands and different things will pay you a lot of money actually if you leverage it the right way to do yeah. that and the music yeah. that just becomes like a top of funnel like attractor right right it's a scraper it's just i'm just i'm just gaining attention you know for to, to get them down here yeah it's like the music is just like bait it's like i'm fishing every day i'm gaining 20 new fans it's like that kind of thing it's like okay i'm just looking for 20 new fans every day to bring into the ecosystem to to kind of you know, monetize and stuff like that. So yeah, that's what it's kind of become. Just become scrape. Music has just become the bait, you know, at this point. And the more your music can resonate with people, the, the faster this can grow. But oh, just quick. taking the music and leaving the rest of it probably won't lead to much of a successful career. At all. Yeah, which is wild, you know? Maybe it'll satisfy you as a person. Great. Mm -hmm. But that's if we talk about a business, yeah, then it's a, it's a different story, you know, as far as surviving and stuff like that, for sure. I love that. Yeah, I think that's important stuff. And uh, it's hard, I think, for the artist mind to sometimes think like a business mind, right? Yeah, not everyone has both, you know, that duality, you know, it's it's kind of, it's, it, and I feel bad because I know, I think we both know a bunch of talented people, you know, but they just need help, you know? And n not everyone wants to look at analytics and data. Like not everyone wants to do that. You know what I mean? Like it's daunting. It's a daunting task. But if you had the right team and which is not easy <laughs> to find, you know, um, then, you know, that artist can flourish. But I think not everyone wants to do that, especially on an independent level. A lot of people probably don't believe in you yet. Right. So you're probably doing this stuff by yourself. So you get stuck in that place of, you know, having to be everything, you know, and that, and that's a lot, you know, doing contracts with producers like that is, a, you know what I mean? That task in itself, I hate that task, you know, like it takes the fun out of everything. When I'm talking to the producer, we did all this music. Now we're like, okay, well, it got to be 20% on the pub, 30% on the writers. And then we'll do the splits this way. That is, I don't want to do that, man. You know, I just want to make the music and put it out and just enjoy the, you know, the feedback and putting the art out there. But we have to now have to. So there's this whole need probably for a lot of uh, artists coming up, uh, business coaching, you know, and uh, oh, yeah. lawyers and different things. People need to really engage with that sort of uh, learning and, and those types of relationships because uh, I just think it's really hard for a lot of people to transition from that artist mind to the business mind yeah. without a little bit of help. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, the lawyer thing, you know, like that is uh, that's a tough one, too, because a lawyer costs a lot of money. It can, you know. So, you know, you tell the average guy. And I remember when I was 17, when I was 19 years old, I remember I got a deal from I got an offer from Universal Music. It's my dream. Right. I'm 19. I'm like, oh, my God. I went to the office. They showed you around. And I remember my mom. That was, you know, my mom. Everybody's mom is their manager at 19. Right. Um. <laughs> We went in there and they were like, great, we're going to send you the contract. I'm like, oh my God, I'm about to get a contract. I'm about to get a deal, you know? Um, and the contract came in the mail and it was 27 pages long. And I remember sitting there with my mom. My mom was like, I don't know what this any of this means. And I was like, it, what do we do? So we went to a lawyer and the lawyer said, hey, if you want me to look at it, uh, we want $2,000. And I said, <laughs> me and my mom was like... Oh no, what do we do? And I cried about it because my mom knew better. You know, thank God. My mom knew better. It was like, we can't sign this without understanding it. Like, we don't know what this means. So 
I want him not signing it, which was the greatest decision because I've gone back to that contract and go, oh my God, I would have been in that deal probably to this day, you know? Um, so it's things like that, that I think we're not realizing, you know, people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, when you get a contract from a, from someone in a position of, you know, not having a lot of money, you know, you get you can, you can get in a really bad situation that'll just kill your entire career. So, you know, that, that's something that I think we need to figure out on the independent music side as well, kind of getting people help, you know, as yeah. far as that's concerned on the legal side. Yeah, we launched uh, elective programs in our, as you know, in our uh, school. And uh, nice. a lot of that is just on the business side and even the legal side, just kidding help right. for people. Uh, technical right. skill and, and all of that is one thing, but if you can't figure out the rest of, as we're as we're speaking of, about right now it's very hard that is to, to do anything with that is it, you so. guys are doing a service man like seriously man because there was you know in my time there was no there was no one i literally had to just go to a lawyer and a lawyer i was at his mercy his or her mercy so I, that's that's amazing man like seriously that you guys are doing that do you think people can can do this on their own or do you think people still need major labels what's the power of the major label in in modern music industry um, I think the power of the, the label is money. I'll be honest with you. You know, they're the banks to me. That's how I see them as banks. Um, I think that they use or they have access to a lot of backdoor things. Um, I know this from experience. You know, I've been on labels and stuff like that. And some of the things that they have access to, I'm like, oh, I can't get that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, even if you have the money, um, there are certain things on the back end that, we just don't have access to as, as independent artists, which is powerful. It doesn't mean it's impossible to still cut through. Of course, we see it all the time on TikTok and stuff like that. But from a money standpoint um, and from a resource standpoint, I mean, the label does this every day, you know? So when a new artist kind of pops on a scene and you're green, yeah, a major label can take that artist and put you right in the spot, right? You know, as far as like, okay, this we know exactly what to do. We do this all the time. They're polished. Um, and they understand that. But I think that if you got the right team around you, I think you can I think you can figure out a lot of things on your own too. But like I said, saying that you got the right team, I mean, it's that's a that's a long shot, you know. So yeah, I think re I think labels still have a, a huge purpose and I think they're a huge resource for some people. But I still do think it's possible on the indie side if you are well informed, well educated, and you have the right team, which is a lot of boxes to check, to be honest. Sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people say the the uh, l the labels are dying, but you you think you believe they still have power. They're still sure. putting people on the map because maybe they're in with the playlist, they're in with the magazine, they're in with the social publicity media people, platforms. right? Yeah. 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 They're in. They they they're in. TikTok. You know, they see it like this. What people don't realize is something like TikTok, and the reason why TikTok can license all of that music from the major labels is because the major labels allowed it, you know? So in the back of my mind, do you really believe that there's no incentive with that relationship where it's like, okay, cool, we'll let you license it, we'll give you a deal. You can you can play this music on your platform. Here's what we need, you know? Like there's no, there's no way, there's no way, you know? So in my head, I just know that there's a relationship there and there's an incentive. So they have, they have, you know, they have some leverage in that in that relationship. So definitely even with the social media platforms, I think labels have a little bit more power, you know, in that regard. Got it. Yeah. You've been uh, moving and shaking the industry up with a, a lot of your ideas that you've, you've come out with. You're making plugins. You're teaching people. Do you feel right. like there's a concept that um, what, what what's the greatest concept that you've contributed to the collective consciousness of the music industry. Um, ooh, that's a tough one. You know, you know, you know what I think it is. I think it's um, it's about being unapologetically just you. You know, um, and I say it in a sense of, you know, when it comes to music and stuff, a lot of us, a lot of people believe that you got to be this the coolest person in the room. That you have to be super smooth. Um super mysterious and stuff. And I think that for me personally, I think what shocks people, what, what, when they look at what I do, they're like, man, he's just kind of just being himself. And the person I see on social media is literally the same guy that I meet, you know? And then, 
you know, with the music, you find out this dude's a nerd. He has this teaching thing on the side. It's like, you know, I, I think I've, I think I personally show people that, hey, man, you could do anything you want. There's no limits. You can be successful on this side of the coin and also this side of the coin. You know, I've, I've, re I've been blessed enough to even have a publisher that I get a lot of sync placements for TV and film. So I've had a bunch of sync placements for TV shows, um, you know, ads, product placements. And I think that my fanship seeing all of this, they just accept me for just, yo, man, that's just Devon. And just Devon just does just what he does. And, you know, and I think that that's been my biggest thing, just being all around, you know, and not being afraid to say, well, I don't want them. I want to keep this separate and keep this separate. I don't want them to know about, you know, ABC. I think I've, I've done a really good job of kind of being able to dip into different things, but it's still all feel like, you know, cohesive. Like you just come to me for me and that's it. So I think that's been my contribution from a standpoint of, okay, well, what is that career like, you know, as far as what I've given and done? Right. Because yeah. if authenticity, I mean, if, if the artist is the product, right? Right. Then authenticity, people are going to connect with that, right? It's not something Hands. to run away yeah. from anymore. You don't have to have this rock star persona anymore. Like maybe yeah. you felt like you used to have, need to have back in the day, right? Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, I play video games with my fans. You know. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I know you're. You know, you're just a big, a big nerd. You kind of lead into that a little bit, right? Yeah. Seriously, man. And guess you know what I always tell people? Guess what? Other people are this way as well, and they're gonna connect to that. You know. So that's why I say, you know, be yourself. People like you exist, and you're gonna resonate with those people. So whoever resonates with me, those, those are my fans, man. You know what I mean? And and that's that's what I lean into. So I make sure I I stay you know, very susceptible to that. And I make sure that, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't deviate from that. You know what I mean? I make sure I just, Hey man, just be yourself. If I'm goofy, you know, I do funny stuff with music and stuff like that as well, you know? So I don't want to change that, you know? And, and sometimes a label can come along and say, well, we want to put you in this and this. I'm like, well, that's not really me, you know? And they know P t today it's too easy to be had, you know, to, for people to know, Oh, that's, not you like what are you doing like we we can pick it up fast so i my whole goal is just to stick to who i am what i want to be and and just just do that bro and whoever loves me for that that's who will you know join my you know my my band and and just keep it like that and that's it yeah man i love that yeah that's yeah. great yeah so you educate a lot of students um mm -hmm. you probably see a lot of people getting frustrated sometimes not being able to progress in their career obviously you yeah. i know that you and i know you want to help people progress and that's something yeah. you really care about again you've you've come into our ecosystem you've come into the mastering.com reverse engineer program you've worked with students there to try to help you know increase their skills and and right. is there what's the what's the biggest excuse you hear from students that you think mm -hmm. are holding people back in their career for music from a from an engineering standpoint or from a artist standpoint like or just in general yeah just in general in terms of a, a music career or if you have mm. different answers for each of those go ahead gotcha you you know you know what i really think it is i think i think the biggest excuse people have is time and when i say time i say when someone says yeah i would love to do this more but it's like Nah, man, you know, I, I hear you, I really do, but I think about my career early on and how much sleep I lost and how tired I was every day. And, you know, I had a nine to five. I was running my studio also after my nine to five. And then after I ran the studio, I, now I can work on me, on my music, you know, and then do it all again. So, you know, I think it's just about sacrificing your time and making time for what's important to you I think that's the biggest excuse for a lot of people where, you know, you think that you don't have the time, but time is really what you make it. You know, you can figure I'm, as a human, you can figure it out, man. You know what I mean? Like if you say to yourself, well, okay, I need to get my nine to five to make money to fund my music career, then that's just what you got to do. You know, I got a lot of friends now that I, you know, they don't have any job at all. And their excuse is, no, it's because I'm trying to just do the music full time. I say, you know how you're holding yourself back? You don't have any money to invest into your career. So instead of saying, okay, I'm going to go get the job, the regular job, nine to five, so that I can invest the money into the music career, I'll lose a lot of sleep doing it this way. 
but I'll move a lot faster because now I can invest, invest. I can go to South by Southwest. I can go to AC3 Fest. I can go to, I can move now because I have the cash. What people don't understand is that's what a label would do, right? A la you would go to the label, you could quit your job now and they're just giving you cash to survive. It's all about surviving. Once you can survive, then you can innovate. You can invest in everything else. So I think it's time and I think it's, I think it's just time, man. Like people just, the way they look at their time is just, I think a little warped, you know, like a job, a nine to five, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, go get that job and lose some sleep, you know, and then invest in your career. Yeah, I, I agree 1000%. In fact, I was reading a book called, uh, I think it was called Originals. Uh huh. And I believe, and I think one of the concepts that they talked about there is exactly what you're saying here, which is that a lot of these uh, innovative companies, you think uh -huh. of the Steve Jobs, you think of the Microsoft, you think of the Warby Parker, you think of all these industry changers, right? One right. of the core defining uh, traits that all of them had were that they was that they kept a stable job, even uh -huh. as they're like making their computers in their uh, in their garage, like they did with Apple and Microsoft, whatever else. Right. They kept these stable jobs well into success. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I see sure. this. I see this exactly with people that I work with. That people want to just dive in and they just quit their job and they do that. But that that shoots themselves in the foot because really, you have to just work harder than everyone for a while. You got to work the nine to five because you need something to support the music and right. take pressure right. off of growing in a way that's not organic, right? If True. you put too much pressure on the creativity, if you put too much pressure on growth, you don't do right. it the right way. And it right. takes time. And so having something to support that well into, like longer than maybe you think you need to, is right. something you, you just you just have to do. It's wise. Because yeah. you know what's wild? If you, say for instance, you just, uh, you drop everything and just go into the music, right? No money, you're not making any money. You're gonna make very desperate decisions because you have to survive. So you may take a really bad contract because this is your end all be all. You have nothing else to fall back on. You need to pay your rent. And you're like, oh my gosh, like, okay, cool. Yo, I have to take this $10,000 contract. That'll give me some more breathing room. Like that's not a way to live, man. You know, that's a dangerous way to be an artist or to just be in the music industry, you know? So for me, it's like, hey, keep your job. As long as you know your bills are paid and stuff like that, you're not as desperate, you know? And a desperate person is a dangerous person. You know, you can make a really bad mistake being desperate. So I think, there's a mindset to it all, you know, of just doing it and structuring it. And having a job is not, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. I tell people all the time, there's nothing wrong with it. Nope. Have something to support it. And I, I yeah. think maybe some people like hear the story of the one person who like, I'm going to quit my job and just go all in. And then they get found by some label and everything right. blows up. And that's the point zero 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 one percent Minuscule. And everyone else, you just need to be smart. You have to think yeah. of this like a business. You have to support your business. You have to financially right. support it. You have to give it time right. and growth and launch pad and ramp up. And right. you have to think that way. It's not right. just some magical dream where if you quit your job, you're going to be famous tomorrow. You, have, you just have to be oh, smart yeah. with it. Yeah, you got to be real strategic about it. I think a lot of people, see, what I always tell people is, yeah, you hear about the success stories, but what you don't hear about are the failures. How many? There's way, bro, let How me tell many? you something. Not, we don't make stories about failures. You know, we don't make movies about people that, you know, about huge failures that went nowhere, you know? So I always tell people, I'm like, yeah, you hearing that success story, that's how they did it, but that's a shot in the dark, man. You know, like, what's the chances of that? You know, of, of that happening that way? You get lucky, but I mean, lucky is lucky. You know, I don't know if that, that same kind of thing will come to you. So you gotta be careful. You know, you gotta be, you gotta play the game smart is what I say. Be safe, but also, you know, take risks and lose some sleep. That's what I always tell people, lose some sleep, man. You gotta lose some sleep. Like, it's okay. If you're gonna be successful, you gotta lose a little bit of sleep. You oh, really, yeah. I mean, it goes back to foundational principles that have always been true. Work really mm -hmm. hard, work really smart, yeah. you know, all, right. all that kind of stuff. And, and I think maybe the industry is suffering in a way from, people feeling like it's too easy in some ways and that and that's more than just the business right. like we're talking about here like quitting your job and think you're going to be famous but also in just how you're learning the the skills of songwriting engineering production there's too yeah. many quick fixes there's too many tips and tricks there's too many right, right presets and templates and stuff like that and what people are yes. forgetting about at some level is just like no you actually have to become a wizard like you have yeah. to know this stuff really, really well. 
on yep. a foundational and level, out. right? And I think, right. you know, a lot of the people I see that are really stuck gave in to too much of the quick fix, and now they've right. progressed as far as they can, but they're hitting right. a wall. Yeah, because the fundamentals aren't there. You know, the, they don't, like I said, you know, even in the classes that we've been, you know, you, I've been teaching within Masson.com, I always keep repeating, hey, ask yourself why you're doing that. Why are you reaching for that? Why, why, you know, why is the question, you know, because we tend to, and I've been a, I've been a product of this too, right? Like back in the day where it's like, I'm making decisions based on things that I've learned, but I'm not really asking, okay, well, why am I doing it in this scenario? You know, I'm kind of just like, oh, well, Dave Pensado did it that way. Cause that was the first, that was the only guy that was doing videos back in the day. So <laughs> I would see Dave Pensado boost 10K on the vocal and I'd be like, oh my God. So I got to boost 10K on the vocal every time. And it was like, yeah, but I, not, I didn't ask myself, hey, does it need that? You know, like it, it you know, so yeah, yeah, fundamentals will root you uh, in a better place to grow as opposed to the quick fixes um, with no fundamentals like in place for yourself. Like if you know, quick fixes are great when you just know the fundamentals. Right. Like, oh, that's a great way to do it. Like me watching quick fixes, I'll take your quick fix and, and dissect it. Like the other day when we was in the class and you were like, hey, why don't you sidechain it? Uh, remember that sidechain, yeah. the dynamic EQ? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. I, I agree with you 100%. I, I remember back in the day watching YouTube videos and you watch this cool tip and then you go back and try it in your own DAW and you're like, why does, why isn't it working like right. they said it would, right? <laughs> right, right. That, that was the yeah. point of the tips and tricks and I agree with you totally. Once you have that objective foundation, then the tips right. and tricks can be meaningful. You know which ones are BS, you know which ones are great, you know which ones are time right. saving. You can navigate right. the world of the tips and tricks on YouTube. Right. But right. but a lot of people think that that's the answer. Right. When, when exactly. in reality it's the foundational stuff that hard, it, and there's no way to get that stuff without right. just hard work. Yeah, for sure. And you, you know what I always tell people? I say, well, the reason why you don't see a lot of tutorials or review or you know the quick you know how we work on um our socials, it's not sexy enough. You know, it doesn't get clicks. When I'm saying, okay, this is what <laughs> you know, this is what the attack does on a compressor. It's like you know, it, it's, it, it, what is compression? Like those things aren't salacious enough or, or incentivized enough on YouTube and on the algorithms for people to just grab fundamentals. Fundamentals aren't fun. Like we always, even with basketball, we've always looked at fundamentals as boring. Like, yeah, he's a fundamentals player. He does his thing. Like look at Tim Duncan, right? Mm -hmm. If anyone knows basketball, we used to look at Tim Duncan as, yo, he's so boring to watch Tim Duncan, but then he has 30 points, you know? And he was a called a fundamentalist. Like he would just fundamentally play so it's it's a people it's not sexy enough i think you know all of this all of the uh, spurs under coach the Bob, whole team i, I wasn't sure if you knew they were all fundamentals players yes but they were great yes. when they when they put them all together but right right uh, right no but I, they were fundamental players people always say like oh santa santa is not fun to watch but hey they got five championships or four championships you know so it's like I mean, you know, it is what it is. You know, they know how to win a game. And it's, that's where the fundamentals, being rooted in fundamentals, I think, is a good, that's a good analogy for fundamentals being rooted in it. Yeah, yeah for sure. I totally agree. I wish more people would invest time into that stuff as opposed to, right. the, to the preset or the new plugin that's going to change everything. Or, and, oh, uh, and know, we have uh, a lot of them now. Yep. Yeah, like one button, like one button um, uh, uh, plugins, we got a ton of them. Like, you know, AI and man, we're entering a whole new world, man. Like it's it's weird, it's scary, and it's it's interesting. But I know you know what I mean. Yeah. What do you think of AI? Do you think it's going to take over and ruin the industry or how's it gonna go, man? What do you think? You, you know you know what I think? You know what I really truly think? I think that um I'm I'm worried about it from a production standpoint when it comes to AI. I think producing wise, I'm worried about it because I think I think at some point, and I know some programs and apps um, that can give you a great feeling base. You know, if I say generate a base with a performance, I know some that can give that can will we'll give you something great. What I think about on the mixing and mastering side is, I don't know. I think what we do is so intricate and so feeling based that I don't think an AI program can just say, okay, well, let's get the base there, the mid range there, because there's no right or wrong way to really for a mix. Cause I can give Caleb a mix to mix. I can give Devon a mix to mix. And let's say for instance, that person, one person goes with, says, yo, I love the way Caleb's mix feels. But then another person can say, yo, I love the way Devon's mix, mix feels, you know, like this is, it's so, it's such a subjective 
um, feel that we have that I don't think an AI can say, okay, well, I'm going to do this based on the subjectiveness of this audience. Like, that would be, like, how? You know, like, in my brain. I think that there's still a feeling that we as humans kind of are able to, like, give that it makes me go, man, I don't know about in my lifetime if they'll figure it out where it's like, yo, no more mix engineers, no more massing engineers. But um, I don't know, man. I just think that, I think that it, I don't know where that, I don't know, if, I don't I don't think we're close to AI figuring out how to replace the mix and mastering engineer. I don't know about that. I, I agree. I, I think it's going to be a while yet before they can get to that level of nuance. But AI will be pretty powerful. So imagine a world in which they get that kind of nuance. Do, right. Do they take over then? I, I think, you know why I think so? I think so. Because I think it'll be cheap um, and it'll be inexpensive and people, everyone will have these great mixes but you know what i do think too at the same time if technology gets to that point knowing humans i think mix and master engineers will step it up to just alter everything as far as like okay how what can we do that this ai can't do you know just how we've heard music over the years when you listen to mixes over the years man it's getting insane you know what i mean as far as the sonics and stuff mm -hmm. so i think that I think as, as humans, we'll figure out how to survive. You know what I mean? As far as to be, make sure we're still needed in our industry. I really do think that. We know too much is, is what I feel like. You know what I mean? As far as the nuances of humans and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think I think we're in trouble. Don't get me wrong. I think, they, I think it's coming. You know, but I do think there's still something to be, you know, desired by a human touch when it comes to miskin and mastering for the most part. Yeah, I think that, again, there's a long time before we have to worry about a lot of that stuff and especially i think the human interaction part like yeah. even if a robot was good enough uh -huh. wouldn't you pay a little bit more to have a human interaction maybe for 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 some people for for the people who really care about their music who are really passionate about it right. like that's always been a part of music i think people will still want that even when robots get good enough yeah and you know how you know that um we can look at something like a like a lander right that does like the automated mastering and stuff like that it's been around for years like years and years and years but has everyone shifted that way no i don't think everyone shifted i think there are select people that use it right um but it hasn't taken over you know what i mean it hasn't really taken over the entire industry so that is a is a nice kind of indicator for me to say okay there's still something people desire, you know, from a from a human, you know what I mean, in that regard, that it hasn't figured out. So, yeah, there's there's light at the end of the tunnel for it, uh, for me personally, as far as just thinking that, you know, AI is just gonna completely rip the mix and mass and engineer out the equation completely. Yeah, I mean, and I teach my students to to give, you know, when the, when they're doing mixes for people, when they're doing masters for people, they're giving, you know, feedback, maybe some free right. mix notes from some free production notes. If you do this couple changes here the mix could be better and I can make right. the mix better. Or if you do these couple mix notes, I can make the master better. Again, right. once again, that's going to be a long time before there's an AI intelligent enough to, to give that kind of human interaction back. And so I think, yeah. uh, the, I think we as humans are good for quite a long yeah. time. I think we're good in our lifetime. I think we'll be okay. You know, yeah. w one beautiful thing I will say is how we personally as mix and master engineers, uh, we do use AI from time to time or just the advent of technology. For instance, uh, let's say like tonal balance control too, right? I'll, they have an option where you can import an MP3 of any song, commercial record, and it'll give you a curve to show you the balance of like, okay, this is how much it's hitting in the low mids. Here's how it's hitting in the highs. I use that sometime and I'll say, okay, let me see their curve and then compare it to my mix curve and go, oh, I need some more high mids. Cool. Boom. Just to kind of compare it and match it. So I think also that's why I say I think that mix and matching engineers will find a way, man, just to kind of like even use the tools to kind of go above and beyond to be even better. You know what I mean? And just and just do cooler things. So I think that as the technology grows, the music will grow and will grow as engineers and stuff like that. Yeah, maybe we'll integrate with it in the ways that are technically meaningful, but still have the subjective human interaction part. And then we're able yeah. to just go to a crazy level, sonic. Yeah, level. yeah. I think we'll become pretty, I think we'll become very symbiotic with uh, AI and technologies as humans. Like us, I think we'll just join forces and make it even better. And that'll be it. I really do think that. Yeah, yeah, I tend yeah. to agree with that. I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. I think there's... Yeah. I think there's good things ahead. A lot of people are, are really worried about it. And even when it comes to AI creating 
music. People are like, oh, they'll just create all the music. No one will create music. What do you mean no one will create music anymore? Are people creating right. music because AI is not creating music? Right. No, they're creating right. music because they want to create music. And we connect right. with people because we want to connect with people. We want to connect with right. a human being. Just like right. you said, the, the artist self, right? That's what we're attracted to. We want interaction. So it doesn't That's matter it. if robots are, are making a ton of music. We'll have that. Right. But we'll also right. have a place for anyone who wants to create as well. We'll be drawn to those. You know, this was a human-made song by <laughs> Devon Terrell. Yeah. And, and right. we want to connect with Devon, right? <laughs> right. And that's it. Right. Isn't that wild where maybe in the future there may be a Spotify section where it says AI generated music and then it's human made. And it may be a, there may be a, you know, like a, a more pure example. Like I only listen to human music, you know, like I, <laughs> that could happen. It's like man. The you people know, like li oh, they only listen to records now. They only listen to vinyl. They don't yeah, listen right. to anything else. Right. It'll be like right. that. Right. Where human music will be a, a niche. <laughs> like, Hey, it, yo, it could, you know, it could happen, man. You know, and it, we just got to be prepared for it. But you're right. I don't think we're not going to stop making music. This thing is in me. I don't care if AI was just, you know, killing the charts or anything like that. You know, I, I'd still make music, man. Like, there's no way you're taking that from me. You know what I mean? So I don't, once again, I'm not, I'm not worried about it Um, because I don't think my, I'm not trying to, you know, like my primary goal is like, I want a number one record right now and stuff like that. I just love making music, man, you know? Um, and that's what I've really just stick to and focus on. So no one's going to take that from me. I know no one's going to take that from me. You know what I mean? I'm going to be able to, I'm going to be able to make this music, like yeah. no matter what. And whoever listens, listens, and that's it. But as far as the commercial game and charts and stuff, yeah, that's another story. I, I, I can see what's going on for the most part. Not to go too nerdy down this rabbit hole, but I think there's, in some respects, the AI revolution might actually create a renaissance in music let me explain like i think mm -hmm. there may be a future that comes where we figure out more free energy where we figure mm -hmm. out a lot of ai taking over a lot of the jobs maybe they mm -hmm. implement some sort of universal basic income at some point to supplement the the, the jobs that are being taken away and what does that oh. do though right it frees up human consciousness to create more or do whatever they want more and so yeah, you actually true. might have a lot more people creating a lot more music because we've used technology to free up the mundane work mm. so that the human mind could be focused on what the human mind does best, which is innovate and create and right. express. That's a great way to think about that, you know? Because if you think about, if you really think about, let's take the pandemic, for instance, right? Where the world slowed down and people were getting paid to not go to work. A lot of people invested into what they, you know, they really wanted to do, you know, creative stuff, businesses and things of that nature. And it showed that when when you when you get rid of the mundane life, because we all all the jobs, you know what I mean? No one was working and stuff like that. It kind of pushed everybody to just kind of figure things out and do other creative things. Like, you know what? I've been meaning to do this, this, this. Like, I can't tell you how many businesses also failed, but also came out of the pandemic. You know what I mean? With people just kind of having the time, you know, yeah. to do some really, some really crazy things. I literally helped me. Devon was kind of built within the pandemic, man. You know, yeah. like this, that whole platform was really built in a pandemic where I just had an immense amount of time. I was throwing up tutorials like crazy. So I think, you, I think that's a, a wild take, but I think there's some validity to that. You know what I mean? That makes a lot of sense to me. Like now you got me thinking about it. Like, yeah, that could be the case. More creativity could be bought. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, we were worried when the pandemic started as business owners, mastering.com and everything like that. But guess right. what happened? It went through the roof it, for us. Through the roof, because man. Everyone's Isn't quitting that their, wild? Everyone's losing their jobs and they're going, well, I got this uh, settlement or I got this whatever. I'm going to go and, and finally invest in my, what my dreams were, which is learning music, right? And That's so right. I think and you'll see a lot of our more channels of that. just search because everyone was searching for it. You know, it was like, oh, how do I produce? How do I. EQ, how do I, like, we all saw it, like, you know, if you, if you were one of us that were already in the space, it was like, we were just, we were in a prime position. We were like, oh, wow, like, I got to feed this more, you know what I mean? And, and, and so that's how a lot of us, like I said, I knew that. I knew it with y'all too. I was like, I know y'all saw it. Like, everyone was searching and just all engulfed into, you know, learning. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? They wanted to learn. So, yeah, you know, I think that would be, it would be beneficial, you know? I think people would be more into the creative stuff. I like to inject palate cleansers once in a while in the conversation, just like if you're, you know, tasting coffee, tasting wine or something, you got to have a palate cleanser. So, right. uh, you know, first palate cleanser we got today uh, uh -huh. 
Fritos or Cheetos? Where are we at on that? Ooh, Cheetos for sure. I'm definitely a Cheetos guy, which shows I'm a little younger. <laughs> Probably. Aliens or no aliens? Where are we at on that? Uh, aliens for sure. They're here now. Uh, I think that, I think, I don't know if they're here now. I think that they are, they're around. I think they're very, I think they exist. For me to think about the entire universe and say there's no other place that has intelligent life I don't know, man. Like it just it, it just seems like impossible to me. There has to be, you know, something else out there. You know, we're not I don't think we're that special, is that if that makes any sense, you know? It's a big place. Huge. Right. Be, Unfathomably big. Well, it's mathematically almost impossible that there's not other life out there, even conscious right. life, right? But are they are they here? You know, have mm. have they found us yet? Right. And that and that's where I say I go, I don't know. You know, that's where I say, oh, I don't know about that part, right? You're like, that's fence. where I get kind of, like, wonky on. Because I can go into, like, because I'm into this type of stuff, right? I'm pretty sure we're all, sure. you and I both are. When I look at the pyramids, when I look at certain things, you know, the Younger Dryas theory, impact theory. Like, I I look into these things, too. It's There's a lot of things that's unexplained that we kind of just go, ah, I don't really understand that. So we just kind of overlook it. But, yeah, it's possible. It's possible is what I say. They could be here. Yeah. Some, some 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 ancient alien uh, hypothesis maybe uh, they interacted historically maybe they still mm. are is that is that kind of what you're leaning into? Yeah, when I look at the pyramids and how the the blocks are cut perfectly, you know what I mean, and it's like, bro, how, bro? Like you know what I'm saying? Like how? Like somebody ex explain it to me, you know? And until you can explain it to me, I have to assume other things, you know what I mean? In that regard, so yeah. Exactly. I think we've interacted with them in some way, shape, or form. Love it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm on the fence, too, but it's fun to think uh, about, right? It's yeah. fun. Yeah, I mean, it's fun to think about. It's like, yo, what? Like, is that possible? <laughs> I know we as educators are also always still learning, still growing. What yeah. concept right now is front and center of your mind? What have you been focusing on? What have you been uh, learning right now? Man, I, when I mean I'm all in on harmonic saturation mm. and phasing right now, but I'm like... I'm like obsessed with harmonic saturation and phasing right now. Like phase cancel. Like I'm, I can't even. I can't even begin to like explain how much over the past six months deep diving into harmonic saturation has literally changed and altered my entire mixing, mastering, and just audio per um you know uh, uh career uh as far as from a mindset of just how I attack audio and how I mix and stuff like that because. I'm noticing that, you know, adding these overtones and shaping the sound with saturation is kind of, man, it's just making the music sound fuller, bigger, uh, more analog, quote unquote. Um, and it's just changing the way I'm thinking about uh, mixes and how I'm bringing more life and more realism to what I've been doing. So analog saturation, emulation, you know, emulation or just saturation in general has been my top of the list along with phase phase has been a real big thing with me right now too as well would you be able to dive into that a little bit master classes for a minute uh what like in in particular like what have you been learning that's that's changed your mindset about things yeah um you know you know what's changed my mindset is i've been noticing so this is this is what's been destroying my mind like just making my brain explode which i'm still kind of diving into is i found uh certain groups of plugins or basically I figured out that my goals with saturation is to add perceived loudness or perceived perception without that meter moving an inch. Like or that's been my- Coming down. Yeah, going down, right, right, or going down. Like that's been my audio voodoo that I've been really just diving into is just not increasing the voltage as old school engineers would say, but it sounds 3db louder. It's like, how is this possible? You know, like oh, recently I've been able to get my mixes ridiculously loud and my limiter has been getting lower and lower as far as the threshold. Like, bro, I'm talking about, I'm getting like negative seven uh, luff mixes with just 2db of limiting. And people looking at my, when I'm showing people, they're like, how is that possible? I'm like, I'm, I'm telling y'all, this and the saturation and adding harmonics is really where that loudness in perception is is playing a really funny and weird game right now, you know, where I'm getting stuff <laughs> to hit hard with less limiting, you know, and it's 
giving me is keeping my dynamics and that's what that's where the beauty is coming in because i'm not destroying my dynamics so much with cranking that limiter down to really squash it i'm really just adding adding so much uh saturation without adding any volume technically to the meters and it's just sounding a lot better so that's been my that's been my little trick right now i'm not gonna lie to you like that's something i'm really really not playing around with and the phase thing as well, like I was saying. We'll get into yeah. the phase thing uh, to to dive into this because uh, I'm into I love saturation too. I think it's sure. like it's it's pure magic, right? It is. And, uh, it is. Uh, I think it's doing a few things for us uh, in mixing and mastering. It's obviously creating those harmonic distortions, which are pleasing to. We wow. love those as humans for some reason. It yeah, it's pleasing. Yeah. It's chaotic. Yeah. It's interesting, right? It, we we love right. that sound. It's not sterile, right? So it's adding. Right that flavor to it you also right. see these tape emulations different saturation emulations not only you know not adding gain while adding perceptive volume but right. but saving a couple of db while making while adding perceptive volume yeah man it's it's weird it it's it, 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 it and as a person that I'm, you know we've been doing this for so long it's just strange to see that you know when we see it when we like dude like it's not my my meat my headroom is still there but it's so much louder. It, it, once it, I did it once or twice, it just, it started to just break my, it just started to break my entire like, you know, process and stuff. Cause I was like, wait, 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 wait. Like, how is this possible? You know? And so it started to make me dive deeper into it with overtones and even in odd order harmonics and, you know, third order harmonics. And, you know, and we, obviously we, we nerd out on this stuff, right? And it's hard to find this information. I'll be honest with you. It's not a lot of information as far right. as, you know, even in auto order harmonics and stuff like that. But I'm starting to see more and more people kind of dive into it because I think it I think it's the next level of the t of the trick bag. You know what I mean? Um, As far as kind of figuring this out, I think the the big guys, they've been new a lot of this stuff with their boards and their analog gear. They are I think they already had access, but I think plugins and the technology is now giving me the chance at home to kind of like start to be able to like really really experiment you know what i mean like a scientist with this type of stuff so that stuff you know as far as saturation and stuff like that you know is becoming a, a big thing and i think i i can't tell you how many saturation plugs we see drop every single week now you know what i mean like a new one and i'm i'm on it i'm watching them like okay what does this one do you know what i mean like i'm yeah, on we, it we need to make one Sounds like. Hey, I, <laughs> hey, I, listen, I've been thinking, bro, I'm so ahead of you, bro, with that. I've been thinking about it. I've been like, listen, yeah. I'm trying to get into the game, too. Like, I know what I like out of saturation, so I would definitely create something in my likeness that I would like. Like, I'm a big fan of even order, even order harmonics. Mm. Like, it's so pleasing. It sounds musical. Um, it, It's interesting. Like, you see, even my brain is starting to go like, okay, I like even uh, as opposed to odd. Odd is great, too, for, you know, certain things. But even I gravitate more to even order harmonics and stuff like that. It sounds more musical, more pleasing, kind of complements everything, fills in the little holes in the mix and stuff like that. So that's why I've been getting with it too. This is an interesting evolution, I think, as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the old guys were using the analog gear. They weren't really ever pushing it like we are with modern music, though, right? They right. had a lot of headroom, but they weren't pushing it uh, in that right. analog gear. Uh, right. But now what we're doing is we're using that analog natural analog compression and harmonic saturation to give proceed volume save headroom and what what that means for me recently if you want to peek into my brain is that i've been using a lot less compression yeah yeah i get that i totally understand what what is some uh saturation plugins uh that have been go-to's for you as of recently like what are some that you know you just feel like, you know, some of the go-tos that you've been using as of lately. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I, I, I really do love the Saturn, the FabFilter Saturn. FabFilter. It's on cool. almost every master that I'm doing right now because I'll put it on right. and there's it sounds better. Just Instant. on the basic setting, just like the right. the warm tape or whatever that first one is, saves, yep. the, it like knocks 2 dB of headroom down. It just right. subtly kind of saturates everything in a pleasant way. So it's right. naturally compressing. And then what I'm doing later is I'm going and I'm I'm just using a limiter or maybe I'm using two limiters instead of a, a, a compressor to really right. just like get that big, big, big sound. There's not a lot of compression. There's nothing being tamped down at all that's in, in a, other than that uh, saturation plugin. So I use that right. one a lot. There's always like right. the J37 tape plugin. Classic. It's always great. Um, right. Man, I just, I have so many 
saturation. Yeah. It's my favorite. I bet. It's my favorite we all plugin, do too. right? Yeah. You know. When I open Pro Tools and go to my harmonic section, that thing is like, shoot, like I have like a a ton of plugins. Right now, my um my favorite one is the it's from Plugin Alliance. It's the black box design. Mm. Uh, HG, I think it's the HG two. My man, when I mean that thing is dangerous. That is a dangerous little saturation. But that's my favorite one right now. Like that one is just, it's monstrous. I, I don't, I don't get it. It's literally, it's so great that I looked into buying the actual hardware. I was like, if the plugins, I want to, you know, I've, I've been looking at that for hardware, probably, you know, in the future and stuff like that. I've been really looking at that piece of hardware. I, that is one I haven't played with yet, so this is why wow. I'm thankful to talking to you today. I'm going to check it out immediately. Yes. You know, anything you recommend. And let me know how you feel. Like, yeah. I want you to try it out, and I want you to get back to me. I really want you to get back to me on that one, 100%. seriously, because I want to know how you feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. I will check that out. But it brings up a good question. You're talking about buying this this analog unit. Yeah. But. Yeah. But. Uh-huh. But is digital getting to the place? <laughs> Now, we said for a long time digital sounds different. We've right. even had a lot of people that say digital sounds better, cleaner. Uh -huh. right. 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 And then we always have people who say, but the analog sound. Right. But are algorithms getting so good with digital products creating the analog sound that it's almost out analoging analog? Mm, that's in, that's an interesting one. You know what I, you know what I'll say to you? I'll say when it comes to efficiency, right? To debt now with all the technology, I think from an efficiency standpoint, digital is is running at 80 miles an hour like with, with against analog. So, let's say for instance we look at analog in the race, we look at digital in the race. I'll say analog is up here, but man, that digital is it is, it's gaining speed. Um, and a, a big reason I can say is, for instance, we can look at something like Pro Tools. Pro Tools has that heat function. I don't know if you know about that, that heat function where basically they have like this console kind of style emulation on every single track that you just flick on and it gives like this analog kind of saturated sound to every single track. And it's them kind of trying to emulate to my brain like an analog board. And when you put that thing on, it's like, whoa like it, you notice a difference you know what i mean in that sound where they kind of unsterilize um it's kind of like it's unsterilizing every track so i think with things like that i think we're starting to see where digital is like oh we're starting to figure out why we love analog so much it's those nuances it's that saturation it's the difference you know in all of our tracks and things of that nature i think a lot of people don't notice about there's a program called luna from you from universal audio and Luna, no one's talking about this, but they have, basically, it's not really a DAW as they've explained it to me, but it's more of a multi-track recorder. Mm -hmm. And basically, every track, you can throw on a Studer, uh, Studer tape. You can throw on, um, you know, console emulations for every single track as soon as you import. So they're kind of even dipping into the place of, Luna's more of a board. It's, it's a board, you know, yeah. a digital board that has saturation and gives you that feeling. So I think we're starting, to, our industry is starting to figure out what we want from analog to bring into that digital space and have that convenience and that efficiency. I think we're we're headed in that direction. I think digital is gaining, you know, some ground for sure now. Five years ago, I never thought I'd be having this conversation because I'm an absolute analog gearhead. Same. Love all that stuff. Right. And, and yet, I will be totally honest. I have uh -huh. recently sold almost all of it, all my hardware. Wow. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's because, insane. Because I was finding myself, I mean, it was slowing down my workflow, for one, recall right. and all that kind of stuff. And then, recall. Soon, but then I started to hear that I could do things with digital that weren't just sounding better, but even more analog than analog. Right. For example, I mean, I'm. I, it's like, I could have a room full of gear, right? But a lot of times, these really great analog emulation plugins—they're not mm -hmm. just an, an, uh, you know uh, copying uh, a, a genre of uh, a type of sound. They're they're going to they're flying to Lon London and finding the best box that's ever existed, the famous one from Abbey Road, and they're emulating that one to one. Right. 
Right. So you're pulling in the best box from that London studio and you're pulling that best box from that L.A. studio and that best box from that New York studio. And then they're, right. they're all at your fingertips. Right. It would be impossible right. to have that kind of uh, gear, you know. Right. Right. The access to it. Right. Yeah, I see the same thing. It. Yeah. And, and I look when, at when it gets to the point where uh, I can pair back and forth between the box I have and, and the other box and I'm going. Ooh, see, see, in your case, with you having so much analog gear, uh, that's an amazing kind of way because you can, can you can genuinely sit there and compare, like you know what I mean, and like you can listen and say, hey, if there's just a marginal difference, you know, like something very marginal, I'm gonna go with the digital, you know what I mean, like and keep that in my workflow because guess what, I can turn that on and off. Recall is easy; it's more efficient. Yeah, if if for analog to not to, to not sorry for digital to surpass my analog gear there has to be a stark difference you know what i mean it has to be like okay i can't, i just can't get this sound out of the out of the plugin but when we're talking about the plugin kind of being you know in a space where it's like i kind of can't tell yeah i'm gonna go with the plugin nine times out of ten i'm just gonna go with the plugin and i, and I understand that you know what i mean so i, I totally get that like for me the only analog gear i have right now today is my dangerous two bus plus uh, summing uh, amp. Cause I still love the sound of summing. Like, you know what I mean? Something about being able to stem everything out, separate it, and then get that back in. There's something about it. Uh, I have my Neve Master uh, Portico bus that has saturation, stereo widening and things. And then I have my Prism, which we talked about for a conversion. So, you know, I, I've, I've been in a place where I've been kind of like, finding my essential pieces where I'm like, well, they haven't figured this out yet. Yeah. And they haven't figured that out yet, you know? And I'm just kind of keeping those things in, 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 in place. But like I said, I don't need much yeah. like now. Like I really don't. Before all the gearheads that are listening to this uh, light fire to the channel, I will yes. say that there's, there's still <laughs> a lot yes. of great analog gear that hasn't Please. been emulated yet. Right. Right. And I totally respect people that say, Hey, I just want to get my hands on knobs. That's what feels good to me. I totally understand. But what I think what I think is valuable about the conversation though is I think there's a lot of people out there who think the the price of entry has to do with gear mm. into this industry of doing high level stuff, high level engineering and producing. You have to have, you know, a million dollar room and you have to have wow. millions of dollars worth of gear. And I think that's a mental barrier for a lot of people wanting to get into this. And so right. as far as I'm going with this, I'm not trying to uh, tell anyone to stop using analog. I'm saying if you don't, if you can't do that, you need to realize that digital's gotten so good that not only can you create great sounding stuff, you can create analog sounding stuff that could compete with the best stuff that's out there. And there shouldn't right. be a, you shouldn't have that mental barrier of a price to entry. It's very hold true. You back. Very true. Right, right. I see, I say the same thing. I'm like, hey man, you, I can tell you, go get yourself a Waves Gold Bundle, get you a DAW. And my and my man, you could you could fight, you could have a dog in this fight. You know what I mean? Like I always felt, I'm like you could have a horse, you know, in this in this race. Like for hands down, I've seen people do some amazing things with the most minimal of things. I think what blows my mind is when I watch some of my favorite engineers pull up a plug and then I'm like, they use that EQ, like you know what I mean? Something that I've just like what? Like I have that EQ. I didn't think about that. You know what I mean? It's just I think knowing your tools is what's important. So we do, we do these fix the mix challenges every month at mastering.com. And a lot of times uh, people will be like, you know, can you just use stock plugins on the whole mix? And we're like, yeah, no problem. Right. right. We'll just use Logic right. stock plugins for the whole thing. And people right. are just like, you know, that surprises to everyone because everyone thinks it's about the plugin. It's about the next thing. It's And yes, there are plugins that are great, right? There sure. are some limitation, but if you know your tools, you're good to go. It doesn't matter. You could use stock stuff and create great sounding. I mean, there's yeah. there's producers out there proving that. You see it all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, when I when I watch, uh, for instance, one of my favorite mix engineers, when I watch Leslie Brath Brathwaite mix, and I see him pop open the stock Pro Tools EQ, I'm always like, what? I'm just, I mean, when I first saw him do it, I was like, is that this? What is he doing? And it sounds great. I see him using it on a Drake vocal. You know, it's like, bro, what? Do you, what? So, you know, that taught me, you know, I I add plugins to my arsenal, but I'm very intentional with what I add. You know what I mean? Where I'm like, I'm looking for something. I'm not, 
I, I'm not really looking for replacements unless they really make something groundbreaking where it's like, oh no, that's a new EQ style that I think could work for my workflow. I, I ask myself why I buy these things. You know what I mean? Like I'm always looking for certain things to add to my workflow. So, you know, when it comes to saturation plugins, that's my big ones where I'm like, oh, this right here, you know, DAWs haven't really nailed the stock saturation plugins too well. So that's been something that's been very third party for me um, as of right now. Yeah. There are a few yeah. there are a few plugins that are beyond stock for me that I'm that I get geeky about that are pretty great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, Logic, I always say I feel like Logic has the best stock plugins uh out there. And I'm a Pro Tools user, so that, you know, I, that's saying something. I feel like there's a EQ you guys have that I wish I can get in other DAWs. It's like um uh, where you could change the EQ to like a two B, to a two BQ. It's like a three in one EQ. Where you can change it to tube. You can change it to like a solid state. That EQ is ridiculous. Like that's a good EQ. I've used it. It look it looks like a SSL kind of vibe, like kind of plug in, but it is good. Like I tell people that all the time, I'm like yo, bro, you have a incredible EQ over there that you no one's you you know you don't yeah. know about it. Like it's really good. Yeah, and then they have that Pultec clone too. Yes, that sounds yeah. really good as well. And even the yeah. stock EQ, I use it all the time. Oh yeah. Yeah, the regular linear EQ or the regular stock. Yeah, it's it's you have a you guys have really good plugins, like really really good plugin stock. It's really powerful for those uh, people that get on these fix the mix challenges though to see, and and we make the mix by the end of the three day challenge. We make we we do, we do a mix from start to finish, and we show them by the end of it it's competitive with industry standard stuff, and and then they look wow. at it and they realize you know that's pretty much Logic stock plugins there. Hey, right, it was done mostly in stock stuff, and it's just like. Oh, okay. I do need to learn, you know, the fundamentals of this stuff because if he did it with stock stuff, I mean, he did it for free, basically. You know, he did it for with the <laughs> with just this DAW. Now, I I try to preach that too, and I'm glad you guys are actually kind of showing people that as well. That it's not about that; it's about your skill level. You know. Yeah, I think there's two voices that we're really trying to combat that we see are mentally limiting people. One is the voice that it's that we've already talked about, which is things can be done quickly that you can get to that high level that you could be Kanye tomorrow if you just get the right plug in or get the right preset or whatever right. whatever else it is five tips to do this three tips to do that and you're following this right. this path of all that and you and you think that that's going to get you there so we're we're c competing against that voice saying no it's actually there's a lot of hard work that's going to go into this like yeah you know yeah. No, no one learns to make samurai swords uh by watching youtube <laughs> videos right and no yeah. one's going to learn to be a wizard or a ninja when it comes to sonic stuff unless you put the time in and most people aren't even working in rooms that are accurate for for you know like how can you yeah, even I, begin to do ear training and if you aren't doing ear training how can you even begin to use the tools properly and so it's this cascading effect of a lot of right. foundational stuff missing and then the other thing that we're like competing against is the other voice which is saying again the price of entry is yeah. too much you have to have all this stuff you have to have all this gear to do great stuff well no i mean you see uh Phineas and Billie Eilish doing stuff in the in oh. the bedroom and they're doing stuff that no one else has heard before and they're using like cheap and free and stock plugins and, and yeah. a lot of that stuff and they're winning seven Grammys. So it's like, let's get yeah. rid of those two mindsets. Let's get back to hard work, but then yeah. say, yes, I can. I'm ready to disrupt in the industry and just say, hey, you know, I, I can do right. this. I have the, the uh, creative power. I have this energy. I just need right. to found it with the technical understanding and I could really set myself yeah. free. Yeah, it'll take you way further understanding it as opposed instead of paying two thousand dollars for a hardware compressor, you could pay two thousand dollars and, you know, getting it taught. You know what I mean? If if and if it's cheaper than that, probably. You know what I mean in that regard. So, it's like yo, if you spend the money in in education is what I say. Spend the money in educating yourself as opposed to just going out and buying the tools. You know, I can give, I can give, um, you know, a, a entry level guitar player a a less like a three thousand dollar guitar, and then I can give a uh, expert, you know, a little, you know, cheaper little guitar. And at the end of the day, man, you know, who's going to show up who, you know what I mean? That's what I say. I, we've seen these YouTube videos online where in a video world where you get like $30,000 camera with a noob versus a $500 camera with an expert. And that expert <laughs> murders that noob every time, you know, because he knows how to color grade. He knows how to use the tools. Like, so you know, I see that as a duality in our community too, where it's like, hey man, I can give you all the plugins, all the hardware, put you in a million dollar studio, but me in my little room, I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy, you know what I mean? Like that guy in a little room might destroy you, dude. So it's just like, you gotta kind of play that world and understand why, you know what I mean, that exists and why that fundamentals is so important, man. 
Yeah, I totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. You've uh, you've come in and worked with our students in regard to two things this last month. That's been really cool. Yeah. You've done a deep dive into EQ. You've yeah. done a deep dive into compression. Uh, it seems in talking with you that you've had some revelations recently about EQ use and compression use. Your mind's yeah. a bit on fire about each of those. Uh, starting with EQ, what is it that you've been diving into? What what has changed recently for you in the way that you use it? Anything really special that you've uncovered? Yeah, um, you know, f filtering, um, filter types has been something that's been really, uh, like, been such a monumental thing for me as of recently. Like, instead of doing, like, these hard cuts as far as slow as far as hard slopes like low cuts and things of that nature i found that shelving and changing the eq type really changes the, the characteristics uh of the eq as far as the sound of it i've been recently doing this eq move which i did show in the class where instead of doing the low cut i started doing shelving instead to kind of like do the the typical move of rolling off the lows on the um uh, of the vocal, I've been doing shelving where, so let's say for instance, I'll start at like 200 hertz and then I'll start a shelf there and kind of bring that stuff down. And it has a little bit more of a pleasing sound to me where it, I feel like I'm not losing as much low end. I'm kind of retaining some of that, but at the same time, I'm still getting rid of or uh, attenuating, uh, you know, what I don't want. So when it comes to EQ, I've been finding that the shelving or the filter types I've been putting that into my brain as far as like, okay, well, what, what kind of filter type do I want to shape the sound? You know what I mean? As far as I'm concerned. So EQing with filter types uh, has really become something that I've been really diving into as well as relationships in certain spaces. So when I look at the mid range, I've been realizing, and of course we know, you know, when it comes to a vocal, when it comes to a piano, those two things have, you know, probably not conflicting frequencies, but sometimes those there are frequencies in that range that may be kind of clashing. Masking. So I've been making sure, right, relationships. Like my big thing, like I've been training my brain for more and more is just relationships in certain frequency ranges. So I've been trying to create more separation within those relationships. Kick and bass share a similar relationship. So now I've been really being hypersensitive to the relationship in that range between the lows, the mids, and the highs and everything that exists there, you cool. know? So relationships and filter types have been a big thing for me with EQs as of lately. Got it. Yeah, I wanna yeah. dig into that a little bit more. So you're talking about uh, instead of doing big uh, high pass filters, uh, low pass filters and different things with a really aggressive Q or really aggressive slopes uh, right. that you're using more of shells and different things. Uh, what What's the deep why behind all of that that you found? What is it doing for you that that wasn't doing before you know what it is i think that when i'm using a low cut and i could be very wrong right like, of course i'm still learning this type of stuff as far as why but when i'm doing a low cut what my brain tells me is i'm literally bringing all that stuff to zero right like i'm chopping it out like completely getting rid of it what i'm doing when i do a shelf is i'm lowering the volume or intensity of those frequencies but the harmonics are still a part of the entire thing so what i'm real and this is how see me learning about the saturation and harmonics is kind of coming full circle for me because i'm realizing that sometimes even if you even if you add let's say harmonics or you boost thirty thousand hertz on some eqs right like that really high stuff you can't hear we notice a difference coming down like every move you make with an eq has an overall effect with the phase and and how things shift so what I'm noticing is instead of getting rid of it completely by just kind of limiting it, limiting, limiting it a little bit in a mix, I'm still retaining some of that harmonic characters that make an overall tone for the vocal or for the sound without really just getting rid of the harmonics completely to now have the vocal kind of be a different, whole different thing or the sound be a whole different thing. So I think from a phase standpoint I'm re and from a saturation and from a harmonic standpoint, I'm realizing, hey, I want to retain some of those harmonics that I like, but I just want to limit some factors within it. So I don't want to completely just get rid of it anymore. So mm. that's kind of been my place where that's, that's every, see how everything, my fundamentals, I'm rooted in that fundamental, but now the quick fixes and things I'm learning, I'm kind of, you know, organizing my brain in a place. I'm like, oh, wow, this kind of makes sense. You know what I mean? And I'm getting answers to things. So, 
yeah, that's where I'm at with it. Yeah, for number one, a lot of people don't know, but when you're doing those big uh, slopes and stuff, it can impart, even on a linear phase or something like that setting, uh, that it can impart some phasing issues. Yeah. First yeah. off. And then yes. you're also saying there's something you're finding pleasing that has to do with harmonics. Right. That when you don't cut it all the way out, when you use a shelf, is retaining right. some of that something. There's some sort of character or depth or something that's not being yeah. taken out or chopped out that you feel right. is like enhancing a quality about the the vocal. Yeah, yeah, I'm noticing it. Like it, it's it's in it's it's still giving a quality that I like with still solving the issue that I'm trying to solve. Like I noticed that, you know, there's a big difference when I do that low cut, that's hard versus when I do that shelf. Same thing for the high end. When I do high cuts and stuff like that, sometimes just bringing that stuff down kind of retains some beautiful harmonic still, you know what I mean? But I'm still getting what I want out of it. Like it's, it's an interesting new kind of filter move that I've just been realizing. And you know what the funny thing is, uh, the SSL, like the, the G, like the SSL console, when they're doing, uh, low frequency cuts, that's what that thing is doing. And that's mm -hmm. when I put my EQ curve, that's why I said, I said, what made me really shift my mind was I realized I was going to the SSL EQ just to make low cuts. And I said, wait a minute, let me see what this filter is doing because I'll do the same thing with my other plugin and it doesn't sound the same. And when I looked, I seen it was doing a shelf, not a roll, not a low cut. And it made me go, oh my gosh. And the big boys or the guys that have been doing this for years, girls and guys, they were doing this for years. So it made me realize and bring, now I've took that information and just brought it into my workflow in the digital side with the fat filter, as opposed to doing low cuts. Now I'm just doing like an SSL style, low frequency cut now, you know? So like I said, learning those tools and kind of just taking like, oh, okay, that's why I like it, you know? That's what really tricked me that's what made me go oh snap like that's what it is you know what i mean that's like interesting. The, the, the analyzer yeah that's really interesting we'll have to try that yeah. for sure very cool yeah yeah when Super it comes cool. when it comes to masking um mm -hmm. what do you think people are doing wrong there in cleaning up mm -hmm. masking problems or, or these competitive problems that you're talking about with eq right um i think i think what people may be doing uh that's kind of counterproductive is you know I've heard Jason Joshua say this is pick a winner, right? Where it's like, choose what sound source you want to exist in that particular range. As far as like, okay, I got a competition between my guitar and my piano. All right, I'll listen to the piano and I'm like, I really like what it sounds like at that 400 Hertz on the piano, but I really like the upper mids or the 900 or so with the guitar. It's like, kind of finding, okay, well, I'm going to cut you here and leave you alone here. Maybe not even boost the other, right? It's just more or less, let me just make a little bit of space for that as opposed to cutting and boosting. Because I think a lot of us do the cut and boosting where it's like, okay, I'm going to cut there and boost in that same range. Sometimes you don't even have to do that. Sometimes you can literally just cut one and there's your separation. You know what I mean? I got my separation that I wanted. So I'm very mindful of just because I cut there doesn't mean I'm probably going to boost any other. Um, Sometimes I'll just move that out the way and increase the volume on the one that I moved out the way to kind of make it sound a little louder, but now it's more out of the way of whatever the other sound source was. So that's something that new I've been kind of doing a lot more too, as far as the masking issue. And then obviously the fat filter collision feature has been just incredible in training my ear to kind of, oh, that's what that frequency range sounds like when it's masking? Okay, cool. You know what I mean? And moving and stuff like that. So that's kind of where my brain has been with masking for the most part. Yeah, that's cool. I, th I think I've seen a similar trend with people who are maybe not being aggressive enough with the <clears throat> EQ move. Uh-huh. Because they're, they're thinking, they're soloing it. And right. they're, they're EQing and they're going, oh, that's starting to sound bad. So they pull it back and they're leaving some in there that really should be taken out. But they don't really understand the concept of when when you play the two together. It's wonderful. All the frequencies are there. Yeah. It'll right. sound yeah. as if both are full almost. Right. That's what our ear does. Right. It, it, trick, it, it fills in the space psychoacoustically, right. Right? right? So so what happens is people aren't being aggressive enough sometimes and choosing what you said was like, what part do you want in which space? What what needs to live here, right? right. Get rid of everything that doesn't need to live there, make room right. for other stuff, but just like hard cuts, like massive yeah. EQ cuts, I think, yeah. 
yeah. a lot of times is the afraid. move and a lot right. of people aren't being brave enough to actually do that that's true yeah I, and I, one thing i'll say man, i'm not afraid bro like sometimes you'll see you keep like what is that what are you cutting it's like don't care i'm like I'm, it sounds better you know and I, i've also gotten the confidence in that stage in my career to just do things and go that would probably be considered crazy to some but hey it sounds better like sometimes i'll go to on a vocal let's say i got some harshness dude i'll go to 3.5k and I'll, what I mean, I'll, I'll make, I'll rip, rip a frequency out. I'm talking about 12 dB, a nice surgical cut. And I'll listen. I'm like, I like it. You know, I've gotten to that place too, where I'll be, I'll be aggressive sometime. You know what I mean? If, if it serves the song better, I think some, you know, what's funny. I think there's another side of this coin where some people have been taught a certain way. Right. And they get very stuck in the way that that's not how you're supposed to do that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, you're not supposed to make these big cuts like that. You're supposed to kind of leave the naturalness. I'm like, I hear you. But in some cases and scenarios, if it sounds better, my man, I'm going that direction. You know what I mean? To me, if, it's, if it feels better, then I just did something unorthodox and it is what it is. You know what I mean? Like, I'm very big on that too. So I think you're right in that regard where it's like, you know, sometimes you're not aggressive enough, you know, which I don't think people hear. I don't think people hear that enough. They're 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 thinking of the technique and not listening. At uh, that's it. You're just not listening. You're just thinking of the technique, and that's all. You're doing this the wrong way. You know what I mean? Listen now. Apply the technique. You know. Hundred percent. Yeah. That's very cool. Hopping that's over it. to e uh, to compression. What yeah. has been front of your mind recently when it comes to compression? What ahas? What revelations have you been having? Ooh, with compression. Um. Maybe more on the master, like uh, mix bus compression. I think that's been something I've been realizing that I'm not a, the biggest fan in the world uh, of my of compression on my mix bus. I've been actually having a lot of trouble as of recently. I don't know if my ear has gotten more sensitive to mix bus compression. As of lately, what I've been doing is I've been putting on, for instance, I have the Shadow Hills mastering compressor. I've literally been putting that thing on, not compressing anything. Literally, maybe it might move like just a tad here and there. I like it for the harmonics that it adds. Once again, I'm coming back to using harmonics <laughs> saturation instead to kind of give me my desired effects. I've been kind of moving away from my compressor compression on my mass my mix bus, which has been interesting. And I think it's because I've been adding so much saturation that I'm already in a place where that move is starting to sit back now you know what i mean like I, I haven't been doing it so when it's coming to compression i'm starting to like you said you're compressing less you're noticing like i'm starting to compress less which is great for dynamics so i think that's been my big aha moment with compression is that the saturation that i'm gaining is is a form of compression you know what i mean and now i'm using that form of compression um to not give me such obvious styles of compression and stuff like that so yeah. i've been lowering my ratios you know, one to one to sevens. Now I've been on one to seven ratios and stuff like that when it comes to certain things and things of that nature. And just I've just been using saturation as compression a lot more lately. So that's been my biggest new like, huh? I don't like my stereo bus compressing like today. And I'm just like turning it off. I'm like that feels more open. I'm leaving it alone. You know what I mean? Like that's been happening lately a lot, a lot, which yeah. is scaring me because you know I have a big, a, an expensive compressor here and I haven't been using it. You know. You'll yeah. sell it. You'll sell it all too. <laughs> exactly. It, you got me thinking. I was like, "Huh? Like I haven't been using that." Yeah, like, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. No. It's it's interesting. I think uh, Jake, one of the instructors instructors in our program, he's on the same uh, plane as you, man. He uses mm. he if he's taming dynamics, he's using limiters and clippers. Wow. Right. Almost exclusively. Uh, right. For him, compression is only pulled out when you really need uh, a very nuanced thing to happen because then you have control over a lot more knobs and different things or for character yeah right like i've been using for my shadow hill just color yeah yeah i, I use do. the same plugin and i and i very and i you maybe kiss it a little bit you know and, and i'm yeah. talking about mastering right yeah yeah just a t just a you know just a little like i've been doing that like just a little bit and then i've been like okay i'm cool you know barely compression but limiters and clippers are much more effective if you just want to tame transients yeah and clamp down yeah it's easier to get to it's quicker to get to it's like usually one or two knobs on a compressor or sorry yeah. on a limiter or a clipper right uh, right and, and then the other you know the, the the compressors have a lot more features so 
save those for when it's nuanced. But yeah, I, I totally agree. It's yeah. it's interesting. Compression is yeah. kind of, especially with, as we said, saturation becoming more prevalent and, and better analog saturation, doing the yeah. compression, because it is comp like they're comp it's compressing. Yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of those tape I, emulations I and, and saturators, they're yeah. compressing, right? So, yeah. and, and it's using it as a compressor and it's using it for color and it's using it in the same way we'd want to use a compressor anyway. It's just doing it kind of more naturally sounding or something like that. Yeah, it's it, it, it's it's like this. The compression from the saturation is more engaging with the actual material. Like it, every every piece that every sound source that comes into that saturation, it reacts different, and it surprises me. Sometimes I'm like, oh wow, it tamed the highs and it smoothed out the you know the mid range and and stuff like that. That's kind of like multi. You know, if I think about multi band compression, then yeah, I I'll be honest with you. I've been also moving over to the multi band as like my final stage in my uh, compression, you know, when it comes to certain instruments or sound sources a lot lately, because I've been realizing that I'm using the multiband compressor to really shape the tone, right? Where I'm like, okay, this vocal, I love how it sounds, but something's sticking out. And instead of going for an, a, compress a compressor to compress the entire thing, I've been like, oh, it's just this range in the particular sound source that I want to tame. So I've been doing that. I'm not gonna lie, that has been a game changer for me as well that I've been doing a lot where I'm like, oh, I'm making more nuanced decisions that are really working and retaining those dynamics in my sound sources and stuff like that. So I've been really, I've been having a lot of fun with multiband compression as well. Cause I'm kind of doing less compression and more focusing on areas, you know what I mean? And problem spots. Got and it. that's been big for me right now. That's been really big too, compression wise. Do you find yourself mostly using it on vocal? multi-band or using it on other stuff as well i use it on other stuff as well like for instance if i have like if i have a guitar uh that the low like the low mids or the mids of the guitar sound great but it's just that top end is a little a little too scratchy for me then i'll probably go up with the multi-band and say okay just tame some of the high-end information on this guitar and just tame that but i love how the low mids sound warm and full and and stuff like that so i've been using it on a on pretty much anything you know what i mean as far as um uh, grabbing problem spots in those particular sound source frequency um, ranges and stuff like that. So everything. So what is it that you're noticing when you reach for a multiband? What is it, what is it you're hearing, and and what's the why behind uh, using that there? I know you've you've talked about that just a little bit here, but go a little right. deeper on that. What what is it that you're really trying to do? So you know when it comes to the multiband compressor, what I'm really looking is to shape the sound, right? Because I chances are I already like what's coming in. And there are a lot of things that I love and there just happens to be something that I don't love. So that's how I say, oh, I need a multiband. Cause if I, for instance, let's think about a vocal, very common. If I listen to a vocal and I'm like, dude, the high end on this sounds so good. Like I'm like, it sounds great. If I reach for a compressor, it's going to compress the entire thing. I'm gonna alter the entire sound of the entire thing. The highs might start to sound tight you know, my mid-range might not sound as free and open. What I'll do is I'll say, I love this range of the vocal, but I don't like this range of the vocal. And I'll listen close. I'll solo certain ranges and go, that's the range that's poking out. That's giving me that, you know, that, uh, that sound that I'm really trying to get rid of. So it's really about in the way I'm going about saying I need multiband is when I like something and I don't like something within the entire sound source that I'm actually grabbing. So a lot of times in that 200 hertz range of the vocal, I'll feel like I'm getting a little wolfiness. And if I take a full compressor, I'm gonna alter the whole sound. But if I'm just saying, yo, I really don't like the wolfiness in that vocal, then now I go to multiband and I just 2 dB. Like, you know what I mean? Just a little bit right there and I tame it. If I went to a, full compressor that's doing the whole thing, I might need 6 dB to even get to that wolfiness to get control because it's 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 grabbing everything at that volume. So now it's kind of like I'm doing less and getting more out of the tone and, and shape of the vocal without destroying so much of what is already there. So that's been my, my process now as of lately. I think that's really interesting. I, I think that's... Uh... 
a unique perspective even on multiband mm. in, a, in a way because I think a lot of times when I'm reaching for a multiband on I, I will use it on a vocal for example I'm doing mm. it because of just the the dynamic nature of vocals right and that they're they're all over the frequency spectrum as they change notes right. and so I'm thinking more along the lines of like uh, if there's a certain note that they hit where 200 is just too much but the rest of the time I want the 200 in there right right then, right. then the the multi band's a great choice because it's just going to take it out when when they go down to that note and, and right. leave it alone the rest of the time. But you're talking about something a little bit different, which is like uh -huh. instead of reaching for a compressor uh -huh. to clamp down on certain things or even an EQ that's mm -hmm. not dynamic to clamp right. down on something. Right. You're saying yeah. I'm shaping sound the least a less destructive way. Right. Yeah. For Why me, just attack your problems? From either problems the permanence, uh, from either the permanence of the EQ move or compression, which will clamp down on maybe more than you uh, are bargaining for. Yeah, for sure. And the beautiful thing about the multiband is, if I clamp down on that 200 hertz range and I bring it down 2 dB, I probably gained a little bit of headroom. So then I can go to the overall and boost the vocal a little more. And now I'm getting an even cleaner sound, but even stronger mid-range highs and things of that nature. So once again, the game of inches that we're playing as far as gaining headroom, it's like, oh, I gained 2 dB headroom. Give that vocal some more power. Boom. Now it's like, you know what I mean? Like, this is where my brain is going. I'm just playing a game of inches every time I mix, every time I master. I'm just like playing the game. Like, where can I gain some more headroom? Where can I get some more headroom from and stuff like that? Yeah, no, you're you're right on. I mean, uh, I think a lot of people think that it's compressors and limiters that give you that loud sound. Right. It's not. Nah, it's not. It's it, not it's at getting, all. It's, it's making space, man, you know? It's a yeah. lot of micro moves that you save headroom here, you save headroom there, you, right. you save headroom with a, a saturator, you're doing the right. right EQ move so it's really balanced. It's actually more right. about EQ and saturation and all that other stuff than compression or limiting to actually get yep. that loud sound that people are looking for. But people, I don't know that they're always thinking that yeah. way. Yeah, and I think about it. It's like, okay, well, I'm just gonna do get 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 it to where it is, and then I'm gonna crush it with a limiter and clipper. You know, I know that because I've been there. I've been like, okay, my limiter and my clipper is just gonna do the job. Like I know that's gonna get me loud. But now, man, I've been like, listen, looking at my mix lufts, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like, I didn't put a limiter on yet, but this thing is already like pretty loud. So, yeah, man, game of inches. Like just getting a game of inches, retaining my transients. That's also been a big thing for me now. Um, is Making those, making sure my transients are are there. You know what I mean. That's really big for me right now because that's what to me that's the life of the record. You know, that's where it things feel alive is when I'm retaining those transients um, and making sure those transients have those moments and stuff like that. I've not, been noticing that a lot too. Not clamping too much. Yeah, yeah, just kind of controlling. You know what I mean, and making sure they're actually that those transients are far enough away from some other information so that it's just hitting my transients when I hit like certain, you know, uh, thresholds and limiters and stuff like that. I'm like, I just want the transients to get in there. I don't want it to catch some other stuff, you know, sometimes, sometimes it for, you know, that's a case by case scenario. Sometimes certain stuff is just going to get caught up there, but I've been noticing that too. Where I've been trying to play that game where it's like, okay, let me push this a little bit more, bring the volume down in it, but then the kick and snare and all our transient stuff, that's the only thing that's really like 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 transient like when i look at that waveform it's like okay those are all my kicks and snares cool right there my hi-hats and things of that nature so i've been playing i've been playing a lot of different games lately i'm not gonna lie to you That's like fun. with stuff i'm playing a lot of stuff yeah. those limiters and clippers they do a great job of of retaining oh. the transient or at least making it feel like it's retaining the transient while also saving headroom in a more transparent way than a lot of compression Boy. will do for sure my, my go-to clipper right now is the uh sir audio tool standard clip that it's a little, it's a twenty five dollar clipper, but let, this thing is worth more. I'm, I hope they don't hear this, but it's worth way more than that. Like <laughs> it's, it's good. Like that clipper is, is awesome. Yeah, we use the Ven Audio Free Clip, which is free, which we really love. Oh, I'll check it out. Look, I'm a, I, I will, especially something free. I'll try it out. Like yeah. I'll try that out. You said what is it called? The Ven Audio Free Clip. Free Clip, uh, okay. a, a, a great name for a free clipper, right? I think so. <laughs> Free clip. Free clip. Yeah, okay. check it out. We re we've been really loving that one. Uh, what was the name of yours again? I want to check it out. Oh, uh, Sir Audio Tools. It's called Standard Clip. 
Standard clip, got it. Yeah, standard clip. That And it's so simple. You throw it in uh, soft clip pro mode and it is over. Like that thing is, it, 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 it retains so much of the transient information while, you know, chopping it down and everything. It's really, really powerful. Love that. Yeah. Devon, what's next for you, man? What's coming up? Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, just, I've been really just having a lot of fun kind of creating plugin concepts and stuff like that. So right now, uh, you know, secretly, of course, we're working on another plugin, you know, and just kind of finding our place as kind of like this boutique plugin company right now where we're just like, we're not, we're, I don't think as a plugin company, my company is going to create plugins that are just like, we do this better. I think we're just going to find concepts that it's like no one started this yet you know what i mean and it's simple like we want to keep it really simple and just make tools like oh yeah duh like I, that's what i want you to feel every time we come out with a plugin it's like oh duh like why didn't we think of that you know what i mean i want to keep making plugins like that i think that's my whole concept for help me devon and then on the devon terrell side the artist side um i'm literally just just having a good time just making music doing more youtube content um I think I'm, I think I'm about to start releasing some really cool stuff on my Devon Terrell page where I'm doing like more production style tutorials and, and vibes and stuff like that. I think that's something people have been asking for my Help Me Devon side because I keep that very techie, very audio engineering. But now I think I'm going to move on over to Devon Terrell and start using that for more production um, and showing people how I make music and stuff like that, songwriting. So that's coming. And I'm really excited about that because I think that that's really going to be received really well. Um and that's really it. Going to Nam in April, which should be uh, pretty fun. We'll you see know, you we'll see you there. Uh, nice. You're gonna be there. Yeah. Great. You meet the team. That'd be great. I yep. was hoping you guys would be there. Yeah, Perfect. We'll, so we'll, we'll be there. Great. So uh, I'll be there. We get this dog out. Come on. Go ahead. I tell you, no one's ears are better than a dog's. Nope. Um. Uh. But yeah, that's basically what I'm doing. So Nam, the pl more plugins and just releasing more production style tutorials and stuff like that. That's very cool. How can people find you if they want to know more? Yeah, uh, if you want to check out more of my audio style stuff, you can go to at Help Me Devon on everything. That's YouTube, uh, Instagram, uh, TikTok, wherever. You just type in Help Me Devon. And if you want to do more or check out some of my artist stuff, you can just at Devon, uh, Devon Terrell, which is D-E-V-V-O-N-T-E-R-R-E-L-L, -L, double everything. That works for also DevonTerrell.com as well as HelpMeDevon.com. Everything is clean. Everything is just what it is so if you're looking for audio guy help me devon if you're looking for music guy devon terrell on Love every it. platform it's been a pleasure man it's a really great conversation every time with you um yeah i'm excited for everything that you're doing it's been really fun having you come into our community and work with our students and uh just much love man it's been it's been great great conversation I'm thankful for you and uh, wish yeah. you the best going forward with everything you're doing thanks man same and you know i, I appreciate you guys you know just kind of uh you know, bringing me into your family and stuff like that and just just having a conversation man like i love talking about this like i love talking about this stuff we could go for hours you know that um with this stuff and um you know i just really appreciate you guys just um you know just having respect for me as far as what i do and stuff and you know i have a ton of respect for you guys as well even before i linked with you guys before just seeing you guys all over the internet and just doing what you guys are doing and stuff so i really appreciate you guys the family that you got over there and um yeah, you, you guys always have my support in what you're doing. I think it's really important that you guys are doing it and powerful for other people. Appreciate that a lot. We're trying to do things the right way. We know that you are too, and that's the the, right. the easy synergy there. Is uh, we're we're finding the people that are really trying to do this the right way, and and it's right. uh, you know it's not gimmicks or anything like that. It's just like real help right. for people, right? And good right. people, you know. You're, you're, yeah, that's an awesome too. dude. Yeah, you're a good too. dude. That helps, yeah. right? There's there's yeah. there's enough predatory stuff going on in this industry. <laughs> yes. So tons. We as know. we know, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks a lot, man. We appreciate you. We'll definitely have you on again. Yes. And uh, signing off. Thanks, man. Cool. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for watching episode one of the Reverse Engineer podcast. Uh, one of the topics we got into on this podcast was compression. We actually just released a really great video that dives deeper into compression. So if you're interested in that topic, I highly suggest you check it out. You can access that right here. We actually dive into the difference between how a noob, an intermediate, and a pro-level engineer would use compression. So if you're interested, definitely check that out. And either way, we'll see you on the next one.